Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of A Hitler's Canary, A Dailing Tale of Wartime Adventure by Sandy Toxvig. So this is Sandy Toxvig, the broadcaster slash TV host. Uh, interestingly, it's got illustrations, and they're by Sandy Nightingale, so we've got the two Sandys here. Um, and yes, it is a middle grade Second World War book. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say I read this on the uh, exercise bike at the gym, so I read this in like a session and a half or whatever is very gripping very good stuff anyway Dane reads Bamster is used to drama his mother is a famous actress and his best friend Anton is one of the most daring boys in Denmark when the German troops invade Bamster doesn't know how to act should he stay out of trouble or follow his brother into the resistance and take the most demanding role of his life a tale of a daring rescue inspired by the experiences of Sandy Toxvig's father during the Second World War so based on truth very nice and uh, we're gonna go right on in, so. So I just love this reaction when his mother, the actress, finds out that the invasion has begun. Mother, I exclaimed, I think the Germans have come. Yes, dear, she replied, we must change at once. By the way, so it is written in first person and narrated by Bamsa. Uh, it's not normally my favorite, but it does work well for sort of middle grade books, uh, especially here because we want to get inside the heads of the characters. It's, it's through the characters that Toxvig shows the impact that the war has you know so we get a reference here to lives kunst the art of living uh, which i thought was cool uh, because i've recently written an article about untranslatable um scandinavian expressions that everyone should know and lives kunst was one of them um but i'm going to read you the first couple of paragraphs here by the way so this is act one scene one i like the fact again um the with the main well the main character's mother being an actress and there's a lot of references to the theatre and stuff so I thought it was cool that that's how it's kind of separated. Um, it's, I've actually never seen it done done that way before in a novel so I thought that was really cool. This is my story. It is my story of when the war came to Denmark in 1940, the Second World War. I can't give you the whole picture of what happened, just what I saw and what people told me. There are hundreds of personal stories from that time, but this is not one in which all the Germans were bad and all Danes were good. It didn't work that way. There were just some good people and some bad people, and it wasn't always easy to tell the difference. I often think of Thomas sitting on the throne at the moment the Germans invaded. I wish I'd remember to tell Mama. I'm sure it would have pleased her. Mama lived and breathed drama. As far as she was concerned, there was an appropriate part and costume for everything that happened in life. She believed that it was all part of what she called Livskunst, the art of living. And his mother gets asked if she has any advice for him, her son. And uh, she put her hand out and held my chin so that I looked straight into her face. But I'm so darling, if you were ever asked to do Shakespeare in the theatre, then always play a king or a queen. Royalty always get a chair and they never carry props. As far as I remember, it's the only guidance in life that my mother ever gave me. Yet I learned so much from her. Actually, weirdly, there's a typo there. It just says, as far I remember. Um, which I hadn't noticed the first time around. And I like how uh, his mum is kind of notorious for quoting things from the theatre. She was always quoting from different plays she'd been in. You could never tell if she was saying something she had thought of herself or whether it was Mr. Ibsen or whoever. Whatever it was, she made it sound good. Thomas clapped his hands. I've got one, I've got one. When the first baby laughed for the first time, the laugh broke into a thousand pieces and they all went skipping about. And that was the beginning of fairies. Peter Pan, screamed Mama, and the serious conversation was over as she and Thomas drifted off into a series of anecdotes about high wires and green stockings. Do you remember that dreadful production where... And this is something, I actually feel like I've heard this on QI, which Toxvig now hosts, but if I did, I think it was when, um, it was when, when uh, Stephen Fry was hosting it. But basically, a guy called Lorenz de Tura, uh, he created a church, and uh, Bams' pop is telling the story here. He made a horrible mistake. The church has a great spire, and when it was finished, the king came to see it. Instead of being impressed, the king tutted. This is no good, he said. The spire winds to the right. I wanted it to go the other way. They say Mr. de Tura was so depressed that he climbed to the top of the spire and leapt to his death. I thought about it for a moment. I think the king sounds ungrateful. Perhaps. Papa chewed on his pipe. Or perhaps the artist knew that his work wasn't perfect and he couldn't live with that. It's a great story. Quite dark for a children's book though. So here we have uh, Act 1, Scene 5. Time summer 1941 to autumn 1942 in Copenhagen. So a lot of time passes as you can tell it uh, here. But uh, here we start to see some of the more kind of visceral impacts of the war. 
Apart from the little incidents, like the beer delivery or giving the odd cold shoulder, I don't know that the family really got involved in any resistance work in the first year of occupation. I didn't really understand the politics of it all. I knew that in the summer of 1941, the German leader, Hitler, the one with the funny moustache, whom everyone called the Fuhrer, he and his men had gone into Russia to try and take it over. They had also declared war on all communists. Danish police arrested 300 Danes, including some members of parliament, for being communists. Some of them were Jews, but that wasn't why they were arrested. In the beginning, it was definitely to do with communism. I wasn't sure what that was, but I knew from school that being arrested for what you believe in was against the Danish constitution. Mrs. Nielsen had taught us that no Danish citizen could be arrested for his religious or political beliefs. Our foreign minister, Eric Scavenus, didn't seem to know this, or he had forgotten, because he went to Berlin in Germany and signed some deal with Hitler to stop the communist. To lots of people, this felt like giving in to what the Fuhrer wanted, and some people demonstrated in the streets. And uh, Orlando, his brother, goes to protest, and he comes back with a black eye, and his mum puts a stake on it, um, which is like an old wives' tale. I don't know if it actually works or not. Obviously, I'm vegan, so I wouldn't know. And we get this little exchange, which also gives us where the title of the novel comes from. Papa was furious. I don't want you getting involved, Orlando. You're only young. This is not your fight. Orlando stood up so quickly that he almost knocked Mama over. Isn't it, Papa? Then whose fight is it? Why aren't you doing something? What's the matter with you? Why are you just letting this happen? Do you know what the British are calling us? Hitler's Canary. I've heard it on the radio on the BBC. They say he has us in a cage and we just sit and sing any tune he wants. Another little quote from um, her mother's times in the theatre. I can't help but wondering how much of this is actually from um, Toxfix's own time. I assume she's been in theatre productions and stuff. I know she's just a general entertainer, you know? Anyway. She had once been in a production of Harriet Beecher Stowe's story, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The play was set in the southern states of America, and at one point an escaping slave was supposed to jump off a cliff into the Mississippi River and swim to freedom. One night the stage manager had forgotten to put out the hidden mattress for him to land on, and when he jumped he hit the floor with a great thud heard by the entire audience. Undaunted, the actor reappeared from behind the scenery and said, Frozen over, and in September too! And Bamsa's uncle Johan is siding with the occupiers, shall we say. Um, and we get this little exchange, which I'm, on, I'm just going to read you the whole page here, pretty much. Everything we do is based on equality and human dignity. Papa seemed almost to be pleading with his brother. Johan, you know that. Johan snorted. All I know is that I will be glad when they make them wear the yellow star so at least you can spot them. Orlando turned to Papa, pleading. Papa, how can you let him sit here? He's my brother, replied Papa quietly. You don't understand, Orlando. Johan, can't you? I didn't understand at all. Uncle Johan, I asked, if you can't spot them without the yellow star on, then they must just be the same as us. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't know them without the star, wouldn't you? I'd know them anyway, mumbled Uncle Johan. They look different. People shouldn't look so different. And Mama quotes uh, Shakespeare, Exit Pursued by a Bear, which is one of the... It's been said it's the most famous stage direction ever written. And I thought this was cool. So Orlando takes Bamser off to where some uh, resistance newspapers are being printed. But this description is cool and also I just like, you know, how they got away with it. One day he took us to the place where one of the papers was being printed. It was a dentist's office and it looked strange. The place was full of men in shirt sleeves working with trays of printing type on their laps. All the dentist equipment was covered in bits of paper and blocks of ink as they hurried to get the next newsletter ready. Bits of paper with more information, or even jokes and cartoons, would turn up at the door marked for the attention of the dentist, and the men were endlessly making last minute changes before the press started. One sheet of paper would be printed, then the dentist would start up his drill, which would drown out the clanking noise as the papers churned out of a duplicating machine. So we get a Helen Keller quote as well from the mother. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. To keep our faces towards change and behave like free spirits in the presence of fate is strength undefeatable. Which is a great quote, I'll give her that. So we get a reference, this line here I think might be the anarchist cookbook. I'm not sure, I'm not sure when that first came about. Uh, but the line is, uh, sabotage is not as easy as you might think. There was a best-selling book at the time, a sort of cookbook with recipes for homemade explosives and grenades, but neither of us knew how to get hold of it. There's a great quote from um, the old, old, what was it, old grandma, I think. Uh, she says, if I hadn't been so angry at those Nazis, I would have died a long time ago. And there's a reference to Chekhov's gun as well, um, because they take a pistol along with them. Uh, she gave a little shiver. I don't like it. Remember what Chekhov said. If in Act 1 you have a pistol hanging on the wall, then it must fire in the last act. That's all I'm saying. I'm not going to tell you whether the pistol gets fired or not, though. Great little paragraph here. The world is afraid, Bamser, of everything that is different. It might be Jews or gypsies or witches or anything that they don't really understand. You must stand up for everyone's right to be who they are. Otherwise, you may find one day that it is you who is singled out, who is seen as different, and then there will be no one to defend you. 
and uh, he goes off on a mission to find this woman's uh, funeral dress. They're, they're like fleeing from the Nazis, and uh, but she wants a funeral dress. And he says, uh, how odd to be thinking about saving your life and about preparing for your funeral at the same time. Maybe that was what everyone was doing. And um, basically, Mrs. Jensen's cow is a kind of plot device she keeps coming into it. There's a taxi that runs on its manure because supplies are low. And uh, so they're trying to flee in this taxi. We drove north for 40 kilometers, stopping once on the way to persuade Mrs. Jensen's cow to give us a bit more fuel. It wasn't very glamorous, fleeing the Germans by sitting on a grass verge, waiting for a heifer to relieve herself. So this is really dark, the way that this, um, not a main character, but one that's, one that's referenced, uh, the way they die. And again, bearing in mind that this is a children's book, this to me is like as dark as the ending of the, the movie The Mist, if you've ever seen that. Right, listen up, please. Children were shushed as the frightened Danes gathered round. Nothing is going to happen until well after dark and I need your complete cooperation. This is not an easy operation and yesterday things very nearly went wrong. When you are told what to do you must follow the instructions to the letter. Yesterday's group went down to the beach with clear instructions to wait for a signal of the letter A by torch and then answer BD. When the signal came it was not the letter A but some bright spark decided perhaps the fisherman had forgotten how to do the letter A and so the BD reply was sent anyway. Instantly a searchlight hit the beach and everyone had to run for cover. In the panic one man had cut the throats of his wife and two kids and then his own. He never knew that just an hour later the boat for Sweden arrived safely. Do not try and take things into your own hands. We will look after you and God willing this time tomorrow you will be safe in Sweden. And uh, then we have the author's note here. Um, I once asked my father why the family had taken the chance and he looked at me and said because it was the right thing to do. It is a lesson which we would do well to remember. So yes, um, very you know powerful, moving novel. Again, it's more it may, kind of aimed at middle grade readers, but I think anyone of any age could get a lot from this book. Obviously, it is quite dark in some places, so bear that in mind if you do plan to give it to children. Um, I also think, for me, it was a damn near perfect novel, but the ending was a little bit lacklustre. I mean, it kind of had to end, I suppose, in the way it did, but it kind of just seemed to fade out rather than anything. Um, but I did still enjoy it. I gave Hitler's Canary by Sandy Toxvig a strong 4.5 out of 5. Would definitely recommend, um, especially if you're into books about the war and, you know, about the human condition. So there we have it. That's what I made of Hitler's Canary by Sandy Toxvig. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.